welcome everybody to the to the second session of the Novak planning meetings. Uh, I'm going to put up my slides to start just to just to give the agenda. Uh, we have three members who are going to be speaking tonight about um, their experiences in uh, in recent not so recent eclipses. If I have this right, Greg Vaughn, he went to see his first eclipse in 2017. Lloyd Franklin has had experiences now with solar eclipses on all the con continents. Uh, and Dan Ward is uh, an experienced observer of all types. And he's got a, he's gonna be telling about his lessons learned specifically for eclipses based on his experience in, in many kinds of, of astronomical observing. After these, those presentations, we'll talk a little bit about what's been happening about NOVAC preparations for, uh, for the eclipses, and we'll talk a little bit about how to schedule the next meetings. So Greg, you please take over. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Alan, for the introduction. Uh, as Alan mentioned, this was my very first eclipse, and I got very excited about it. Uh, I did a lot of preparation, uh, I thought, I got energized first by seeing a, a video uh, from uh, uh, Espinac uh, and was already behind the eight ball as far as getting reservations and stuff, but everything came together at the last minute, had a wonderful time, met wonderful people, uh, everything generally worked out well. And I'll just talk a little bit about uh, what did and didn't work and any of the lessons learned that I've applied uh, for the upcoming eclipse. Okay, next slide. Uh, so the location factors is a big thing. You have to pick your location. And for me, uh, other than the obvious uh, being in the path of totality and preferably in the center so that you have the longest time in totality, the big factor for me was availability of lodging. And as I mentioned, I got started a little late in 2017 and everywhere I called, they were all sold out. And uh, it just so happened that I found a Hampton Inn in Riverton, Wyoming that wasn't sold out, horribly expensive, but they also had this feature where you could mix points and dollars. And I was able to use some of my Hilton points uh, to bring it down to something uh, reasonable. And um, uh, it was the kind of thing that built very rapidly as far as excitement and enthusiasm. And I've got two pictures uh, there. Most of the people staying at the Hampton were for the eclipse. And then down below is a picture of just across the highway from the Hampton Inn. They had put up this bale of hay that says on there, let's see what it says. I, I took a look at it and blew it up because I couldn't read it that well, but it basically says uh, Eclipse, yeah, Eclipse campsite. And it wasn't a campsite of any, uh, at, of, of any measure, but it was part of the excitement and the craziness that was going on in association with this. Um, so I took a look at the interactive um, map and it showed that in Riverton, just by chance, it had one of the lowest chances of clouds of any of the places uh, on the map. And then uh, adding to that, it was in fairly close proximity to friends and family in Salt Lake City where I could ship uh, gear to and use as a, a base of operations. And then the bonus was that uh, I wanted to make sure that if I really screwed this up badly, or we had really bad weather coming at the last minute, I had something else to do. And I'm, I'm big in photography generally. So my plan was after the eclipse was over to go to the Grand Tetons and spend a few days up there. So those are all some of the factors that uh, played into picking a place. Uh, next place. And I'll try to go through these a little uh, quicker. This is just showing you where Riverton is. If you look uh, up there to the north, you can see that uh, um, to the northwest, Jackson uh, or Jackson Hole uh, is there. If you look uh, down a little bit uh, to the south uh, east of Riverton, you can 
you can see where Douglas and Casper are. Uh, both of them sold out, uh, couldn't find anything. And then I really had two options as far as airports. One was Salt Lake City, the other was Denver. I picked Salt Lake City for the reasons that I described. Next, please. Uh, so the timeline, uh, this is important just because it's not just hop on a plane and get there and hop on a plane and come back. Um, I, I actually uh, looked on Astromart and found a mount that I really wanted to use that was portable, although I still needed to ship it. That all came in uh, uh, several months before I left. I got a chance to use it and test it and get familiar with it. But on the 10th of August, I delivered all my equipment to FedEx and uh, shipped it. Uh, I flew out on the 17th of August just to make sure I had plenty of time for that equipment to arrive uh, and spent time with my brother and his family and then headed off to Riverton. I left on the 19th and it turned out that traffic was projected to be awful, but it was just fine. It took the back roads and that part of Wyoming was relatively uh, uh, quiet. On the 20th, on the morning of the 20th, I set up the telescope and all the equipment, made sure that the uh, equipment was running uh, properly, not just the mount, make sure it was in the right time zone, make sure it was in the right latitude, all of those kinds of things, but also made sure that the intervalometer uh, worked well and uh, that I didn't have any issues with respect to a rough puller a daytime polar alignment because I was taking all my stuff in the evening. Then on the next day, I set up again. Uh, I met some friends on the 20th of August and we sort of shared responsibilities. He would watch my stuff when, when I made a bio break and I would watch his stuff and we shared tips and tricks. And he had an iPhone connected to one of these battery powered speakers that had the uh, uh, eclipse timing uh, broadcast on it. So it all worked out uh, pretty well. Uh, next, please. Um, so picking the observing location and a supportive hub, I thought was very important. And again, as I mentioned, obtaining lodging may be uh, uh, deterministic. Uh, in other words, that may be uh, the single thing that uh, cinches where you're going to go, especially depending on how portable your equipment is and, and that sort of thing. Um, you have to figure out where to ship it to. There were a lot of professionals that were at the Hampton Inn, surprisingly, and they had a lot of gear shipped directly to uh, the hotel. I'm uncomfortable with doing that, so I, I would recommend... Uh, a different approach. And, and so that's what I used. It did allow me to bring other gear for the trip uh, to the Tetons afterwards and uh, not worry about uh, all the baggage that I was going to handle by myself at the airport uh, and the excess baggage fees. When you go over your two allowance, I think it's $150 a bag. And uh, I didn't want to pay that. I think it was actually $150 for all four packages that I sent. Uh, but that was one way. So $300 round trip. And then I believe in an early arrival and a late departure from the area. Early arrival is to make sure your gear is set up. As I said, make sure right time zone, right latitude. Uh, everything works as expected. Do the dry run. Uh, the day before, that sort of thing. And then on the back side, my God, I couldn't believe the traffic. It was all funneling down towards the, what is that, I-25 that goes through Denver. And it was just clogged, even where we were in that little highway that went next to uh, uh, the Hampton Inn. So I was glad that I didn't uh, leave until the following day. It just made it for a much more pleasurable experience. Next, please. Uh, what didn't work so well? Well, obviously the big thing is the lodging. I started late. I was scrambling to find a place. Uh, all of the selections that I could have made were poor, at least monetarily. Uh, had one place in Jackson 
and the other place was Riverton and all the other places were frankly uh, sold out. One of the things I could have done a little better was understand what gear I needed to take in order to take advantage of the dark skies after the eclipse was over. And I can talk about that in more detail if you like, but I didn't bring uh, a, uh, a polar alignment uh, gear. I didn't uh, uh, bring any guiding gear. Uh, so there's a lot of things I could have done uh, better in that regard, although it would have required me to take a little bit more uh, equipment uh, to do that. I didn't have a real good backup plan for being clouded out. And we watched uh, the weather very closely and it looked like it was gonna be clear from the get go. And at the last minute, we had some high clouds come in probably about 30 minutes prior to uh, totality and then lifted about five minutes prior to totality. So it actually worked out uh, really well. But if you are gonna have a backup plan and you plan on racing up and down the highway, then you need to really understand your gear well and it has to be able to be constructed uh, uh, quickly and not be too complicated um, uh, with that kind of uh, pressure associated with running for a, uh, a backup plan. Uh, next, please. Additional considerations. Um, I say watch the eclipse progress without disturbing your imaging. I bought a little set of those Lunt uh, solar sunglasses or solar uh, binoculars that are around my neck in the picture on the right. And uh, they turned out to be perfect. They were very lightweight. I could look up and see what was going on and I could watch externally uh, to make sure everything was going. I could hear the DSLR when it was doing its cycle. Uh, and, uh, and I brought some, a bunch of cardboard glasses uh, with me uh, to give to other people. Most people at this location had them. There were a few that didn't, but it wasn't for me. It was uh, to be a good neighbor to, uh, to other people that were just casually watching the eclipse. Um, you can see my equipment in the uh, uh, picture uh, and I can talk about it later if we have time. Um, it's a lengthy event, uh, my first event. So uh, water, food, bio breaks, those are all things that come into play, especially depending on how hot it is or how cold it is. And chairs, I didn't think of a chair, but my uh, sister-in-law said, hey, why don't you take one? And it's got a little table that folds out, that might come in handy. Well, it came in real handy. And I actually sat in that chair and used another uh, uh, DSLR with a lens with a little filter on it and actually took some handheld pictures, which was the source of the uh, original Eclipse Ensemble at the very beginning uh, with the uh, um, orange, orange filters. And then I say, be prepared for excitement or totality. Well, I'm preaching to the choir for the other people who are giving presentations today, but it was exciting. Everyone was in a good mood. Uh, everything that was predicted happened and you could watch it and it just made the excitement build to totality. And I talked to some people later when I was up in Jackson and they said that the animals just freaked out. Uh, and uh, they had elk and I think cows and I forget what they said they did, but uh, I think they started mooing and crying and it was uh, yeah, pretty interesting. So my point is there's a lot of things going on at Totality, one of which is taking off your filters, putting your filters back on, but try to make sure that you're familiar enough with your gear and have practiced that enough that it doesn't interfere with your ability to enjoy the eclipse. I actually set up a little point and shoot camera on video about 30 feet behind where this is shown just to capture what was going on during totality. It's not Oscar worthy, but it is a nice memory uh, that I have. Okay, next please. Okay, so this was the uh, ensemble that I got from the actual telescope. And uh, the folks at Astrophysics recommended that instead of every five minutes, I take it every minute uh, with a spread of exposure 
just because you never know when you're going to have clouds duck in and out and you want to have enough exposures to cover that period of partial eclipse. So I ended up with a lot. Next, please. Okay, my area of focus, as some others have mentioned, is Texas. Uh, choosing a hub wasn't hard for me because we have friends. My family used to live in San Antonio, so we're going to go to San Antonio. I'll talk about what's been done so far, and the biggest thing that's been done is contact those friends and give them a heads up and get permission to stay with them and use them as a base of operations. And then secondly, is just to get some lodging. Next, please. So if you look at the map, I always think in terms of uh, those hubs, those places that have big airports. And you can see that there's a bunch this time, more so than there were uh, uh, when I was in Wyoming, although Texas is a big state. So uh, the distances are, are pretty far. Uh, but Dallas-Fort Worth is right almost in the, you, you could go to Dallas-Fort Worth and, and stay in a hotel there and, and catch the eclipse. Austin is a little further south, of course. I don't think its airport is quite as robust as San Antonio, although both of them are kind of medium sized. Shreveport, I'm not really familiar with, but it is a, a big city. <laughs> Houston has a huge airport, and then Waco is right in the middle. And I think they may have a regional airport, but I don't think they have a, a regular airport. And I look for someone that, that uh, United flies into. So San Antonio was my pick. You can see Lampasas if you look closely in white uh, lettering in the center there, just to the northwest of Austin. On a lark, I looked at what was right on the eclipse path and I called a uh, Best Western, we call it a Best Western Plus, I think. And, um, and they said, uh, yeah, uh, you, you, you know, we can, we can take your reservation. I said, well, how far in advance will you take my reservation? Well, we can take your reservation now. And I said, really? No one else will do that. And they said, oh, that's great. I'll we'll go ahead and make your reservation. What's, what's your uh, 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 cancellation policy? I think it's two days in advance. So it was a very a good deal. I think it's $160 a night. So it already had a little bit of inflation from, from the eclipse. Uh, although I've heard recently that they have stopped taking reservations and they're figuring out how to manage that. They, have, they may have opened up reservations again, but if they have, they probably raised prices. Just don't know. Okay, next please. Uh, and I think I've mentioned this already. Uh, weather contingency plan. We talked a little bit about me not having one for 2017. I suspect that I'll just travel north or south on US 281 if in fact there is a significant weather event that I need to avoid. And, uh, and again, my burden is to make sure that I'm familiar enough with the equipment that I can take it down and set it up and make sure I'm self-contained, have a battery with me that'll support uh, not having those kind of support, as well as water and food and, and uh, uh, shade from the sun. Okay, next place. So this just shows you with the interactive map, what it shows. Now, I, I actually uh, picked the map that doesn't have the cloud cover, but the cloud cover, as I remember, is 44%, which sounds like a lot, but I, th I think it's actually very good and one of the lowest values along this strip from San Antonio up to Fort Worth, Dallas. And I just put the times for the eclipse. It's gonna be two hours and 40 minutes from start to finish. And then totality, much better than the 2017 uh, eclipse is gonna be four minutes and 24.7 seconds. Of course, that's partly because Lampasas is almost dead center on the uh, path of totality. 
Uh, next, please. And I think that's it. I've got a bunch of other information that, uh, well, was too lengthy to cover in the short period. And, and I really think it's appropriate to yield to the experts. I'm very much a novice here, but was very excited and very excited about this next one as well. And I'll be going to the annular eclipse, but I'm going to go to Albuquerque. Uh, originally, I was thinking about going to um, uh, Monument Valley, staying there at the uh, Indian Reservation, uh, but uh, decided not to for several reasons. And uh, uh, the biggest challenge I had with Albuquerque, I, I got reservations for a room at a Hilton Garden Inn. The biggest problem I had was a rental car. The first couple of attempts I made, nobody had a rental car anywhere. So uh, I finally ended up getting one, not cheaply, uh, but I think they'll come down as time goes on. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Greg. Do anybody have any uh, questions directly related to, to what Greg talked about? I don't see anything in chat. I had one comment on, on your observation about needing a chair and things like that. Um, I, had, I had similar logistics in 2017 and uh, under pressure of minimizing what I brought with me or shipping in advance, I planned to hit the Walmart the first thing I did when I got to Salt Lake City. So I had planned to get a jerry can for gas and a chair and a big coffee mug and some snacks and stuff like that. that just weren't shipping, but uh, I knew I could get at a store in a big city. And I ended up the stuff I bought, which uh, I didn't want to ship back. I had first planned to uh, I figured I'd stop off at Goodwill or something, get rid of the chair and things like that. But it turns out I met up some people who had cars there and I just gave it to them. And, uh, and that worked out well, much, much cheaper than shipping. Yeah, for example, if you were somewhere that was in close proximity to an electrical outlet, you could stop at the Walmart and buy a 50 foot extension cord, for example. Uh, but I, I think I'm gonna ship a battery because I don't wanna rely, rely on that uh, being available. Yeah, it was only the things which are clearly generic and would be available anywhere. Okay. Um, well, let's move on to Lloyd's presentation. Okay, great. So, uh, so let me first tell you briefly what I'm going to talk about. I'll, I'll spend just a short time on my eclipse experiences. Um, uh, you know, kind of go go through what, what I've been and and, and maybe maybe focus a little bit on 2017. I mean, I concur with a lot of the stuff that that Greg talked about, um, and uh, and I could you know add, add to some of that. But but the bulk of my presentation was really focused on uh, what are the considerations uh, to use to and when in choosing an observing location. You know, I thought that was maybe one of the you know one of the focuses of this meeting. And so, you know, I kind of uh, rather than just I have some things I, I I'll, I'll talk to from from some of the specifics of, of my uh, eclipse trips. But a lot of it is just you know general, and, and some of it may have been talked a little bit by before and I'll try to go through quickly on that and, and part of in, in those presentations is also showing you what resources I've used and and a lot of which many of you are familiar with you know websites and other things to make those decisions so hopefully it's it's useful and I have a lot of stuff so I'll try to go quickly and and some of the charts I have are just examples of more stuff in which I can go go over quickly so first let me just show the uh, Eclipses. So yes, I have had some experience. Uh, you know, I started relatively late relative to some other, you know, eclipse chasers. And about just shy of 25 years ago, I saw my first one. Um, something I'd always wanted to do. So I, it was, you know, saw a map and it was going through the Caribbean. I thought, wow, great place to go down. You know, spend a week. I went with a friend, you know, trying to do diving and checking out the area. And then, you know, the day before, you know, looked went up to check out scout out a path you know or, or a spot to watch it which it was the eclipse was going between aruba and curacao so you know we went to, you know for a week to curacao uh didn't have much equipment that first time just like a pair of binoculars a small camera and you know a bucket of beer and so 
you know, we uh, went down and it was just amazing. And then, of course, after that, I got hooked, you know, like many whose first time. Uh, so I said, when when's the next one? And actually, it turned out over the next four years, there were three good ones. And, you know, I and I went to, you know, in, in 1999, I went with my future wife to Germany and Austria. And, you know, we uh, uh, we were planning to, to, to view it in in, uh, in Bavaria, you know, east of Munich. But this was this is one time when we really did the eclipse chasing because the clouds came in during the partial phase. Had to get on the Audubon, move a bit. It happened again about three times moving and then finally you know about the third time all right this is it you know went uh found this spot you know you know near this this lake and uh about 10 minutes before the clouds opened up and it was beautiful and you know and i know that one it was a challenge for a lot of people in western europe got rained on um and then in uh 2001 actually as part of our uh honeymoon to africa you know doing safaris we took actually this was the one i saw on a boat you know, uh, we were in the Indian Ocean, you know, uh, not far from Madagascar, you know, between Mozambique. And uh, and that was a, that had its own set of challenges, which I could always talk if anyone wants. It was a small boat, so it was rocking. And, you know, <laughs> well, relatively small, it was a 120-foot yacht, not like a gigantic one. So, and and, I, and that, and I, if anyone is going on a, a boat, I mean, usually they have big cruise ships now and which aren't, don't have that kind of issue. But that was, again, a great trip. And we, of course, we spent most of the time in Kenya doing safaris and stuff. 2002, we were, at, you know, a chance to go to Australia. And we just, actually, that we saw that one deep in the outback. And that, and that, and that one was really towards sunset. So it was really low in the sky, it was short, but it was towards the end of the path. But that was very cool, you know, visually, you know. And uh, and of course that has its own issues. Luckily, you know the sight lines were very good way down to the horizon, and got to see it, you know, set and in, in partial phase. Two thousand nine, you know, we originally uh, actually were planning on going to see it on Iwo Jima, and uh, but then about it, so many months or a year before the Japanese government pulled the authorization, we had to find something else, and and uh, the opportunity came up to go to China, and I go, well, cool, you know, so. You know, and again, each of these trips, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, it was a chance to go visit a part of the world you've never been to, and you see the most amazing thing in the sky. I think I skipped over 2006, Egypt. Yeah, we were like, you know, with a group to, to go there. I mean, and, and and several of these that were foreign, we actually went with, so there's, there's like a n- number of good tour groups, you know, that, that you know, that, that provides security and other things. That one, we were, of course, touring all around Egypt. We saw it about six miles from the border with Libya, the only place in Egypt that it uh, it, it it went through. And uh, and of course, we're up on a plateau. There was a VIP tent, and who shows up? Mubarak, you know. So that was pretty interesting. But and again, it was very good. 2015, we we another uh, excuse me, 2010. You know, we went to another place. You know, thought of, you know since a kid. Wanting to go to, you know, Easter Island. What a cool place. Rapa Nui, you know, the, the natives called with Moai. It's a territory owned by Chile. So we went through there, had a chance to travel a lot in Chile, see some observatories there. But Easter Island, wow. And to go there and to see an eclipse there was was pretty cool. And then 2015, went up to the high Arctic, uh, Svalbard, the territory of Norway. Uh, and, that, and that was uh, real fascinating because... You know the uh, it was a snow covered plain and and then and in a future session when we talk about things to observe I mean the shadow bands there were just amazing because of the white uh, you know covered plain we were on and uh, and and it was up to then the most beautiful one seen you know because of the very cold very blue sky very sharp definition and of course enjoy did a lot of cool things from you know. You know, the dog sledding to snowmobiling to ice caving, you know. Uh, and finally, 2017, the, the first one in the US, you know, in almost 40 years. Um, and and that and that was probably the closest to, to what we're talking about today, the 2024. Uh, you know, and again, it was an opportunity to to go not just to go see the cliffs, but also to bring friends and family that wouldn't travel, you know, overseas like like we've have. You know, you know, all over. So, so that also had some other considerations. And, uh, but you know, what I ended up doing was, uh, I had met a friend, you know, in Svalbard, uh, uh, I met 
who uh, actually works at Griffith Observatory in uh, in LA, and he was able to arrange, you know, for with the city of Douglas to get a, a, a baseball field. You know, he had about a hundred people for his group. I brought about twenty friends and family, and uh, and it was just, just a beautiful, beautiful day. You know, I mean, I had again, as uh, Greg mentioned, you know, lodging is always an issue, but I was able to also to stay coordinate with the Hampton Inn to get my my group in there and uh you know it, it was uh you know be beautiful day and, and i'll and some of the stuff i'm going to talk about after this we'll go into the types of things uh we did for forecasting the weather you know uh and, and i'll get into that shortly and then finally uh 2019 I had a chance to go down to south america well actually you know i was there before in chile but this this was a trip that actually visited like five countries and we saw the eclipse uh, on the foothills of the Andes Mountain, and that was really cool seeing it above, you know, the Andes. Um, and then I actually had planned on going on back to South America 2020, but the pandemic, and you know, had other plans, and that got canceled. But then finally, you know, just over a year ago, uh, I had the chance to see, you know, go to the eclipse in Antarctica, the only place, the only continent where it was visible. I mean, it was in. And that was an experience of a lifetime. I mean, not cheap, but then we actually flew on to Union Glacier, spent a week living on the ice and exploring, you know, the area. It's the you know, only privately run camp on the on the continent. And then we had a, a clip site, you know, where uh, similar to Svalbard, it's don't cover plain, but it was really uh, amazing. And I, I don't have any photos of my stuff. I could show that in, in the future. Uh, but it was extremely cool. And I, I know that Paul had posted some information back, you know, uh, a year ago when I had provided some stuff on it. But anyway, that's kind of a summary of what I had done in, uh, in terms of total eclipses. And just to add it, uh, I have seen two annular solar eclipses as well, done in Puerto Vallarta in 2002. And the last one that was occurred in the U.S., which was 2012, uh, was at Zion National Park. Again, those are really cool events. Not as cool as total because you know, you don't get the brilliant white corona and, and so forth. But uh, but because we have the other one coming up in just just about eight months from now, uh, it'll it'll I'm certainly I'm planning on doing that too. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is the kind of topics I'm going to talk about, and I'll try to go through quickly because I know it, it is a lot. But I kind of what I want to show talk about is the type of considerations uh when choosing an observing location again these are my opinions but i think they're pretty general there's some general considerations to to kind of narrow down what part of the world or what part of a country you know you you want to go to and i'll go through some of those some site specific considerations once you identify where you're going to go uh how to you know determine you know a good specific place to stay and then of course a few personal considerations too uh, let me first start with uh, cloud cover and weather statistics because that's probably you know the the most challenging thing or or maybe not challenging but one of the most critical things you know you want to choose from uh so the best website you know out there and i know it's been talked about before is jay anderson's eclipse so file website uh, there's a link for 2024. uh this is one this is actually a topographic map he has that shows the uh the eclipse path but then this shows you know the uh the average uh cloud cloud cover uh in you know fraction or percentage in in april uh for along the path and and, and you know as expected I mean, as you can see you know going from uh southwest to northeast it gets pro progressively worse you know for his little cloud in mexico and then it starts you know, again to the u.s texas seems to be the best and as you go go further north but again you know, the devil's in the details. So this is kind of an overall chart. He, he, you know, his website is fantastic in that he really goes into a lot of detail on every single portion along the path. He writes beautifully too. He explains uh, what's what's going on, you know, and why uh, his interpretation of these numbers. And so I highly encourage folks to look through it. Just really quick, I just I'm just going to scroll through these. These are in, in those individual sections. He has details that show uh, that whole path but color color coded for each section so here's mexico here's texas and you can see how the you know how the cloud cover is changing it shows all the key cities uh then we go through 
you know, Illinois all the way through Ohio, uh, you know, Pennsylvania and New York. It starts to get pretty, pretty bad up in the, in the far northeast of the country and then in Canada. And then, of course, ending up, you know, where it leads to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, he also has, which is very nice, you know, these uh, uh, not just the color graphs, but but with this line graph that shows the percentages you know, plotted along basically along longitude. Uh, so this shows you along the whole center line. And and the cities are shown, you know, according to where they are along the uh, what longitude they are. Uh, but he also has details uh, for each each individual section, just like the uh, color uh, color plots. You know, these line plots for each section. I mean, you know, got Mexico, uh, you know, Texas to Missouri, and again, you know, and 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 here. He does show the individual cities, you know, which the ones that are, you know, chosen based because a lot of these are not on the center line. They're slightly different than than the, uh, you know, than what the line is. But it basically goes according to the, to the longitude, uh, Illinois to Ohio. In this case, there's a much enough of a difference between the center line and the north and south limit that he shows three three graphs. Uh, and again, with the and, and interesting, I think someone mentioned before, Cleveland just happens to be in a in a little, you know, slightly better position than it, for for where it is in the country. Um, then finally, uh, Lloyd, Lloyd, yeah. you're going to have to sort of pick it up because okay, I, I do yeah. want to reserve some time for Dan. Okay, end, yeah, okay, I, I will, okay, I won't go through all the details then. Uh, yeah. Anyway, just going through. This is just something that he has some sunshine, but a percent of sunshine but ignore it but then north because it hasn't really been updated in the u.s um one other i'm not going to go into details but one other uh, resource is the goes east satellite you know i took some snapshots you know five years prior to the eclipse you know three years prior and then two years prior you know this was last year again this is just a just a snapshot but this is a good uh a resource too as we as you get closer to kind of see how how it looks um, all right, duration of totality. You've seen this, you know. I'll, you know, uh, basically, you know, Fred Espinak and and uh, Michael Zeiler are two great resources. Um, again, Great American Eclipse con con website has all the details. You know, the blowups really help find out. And the one one thing I want to point out here is that you don't really have to be right on the center line. Sure, the center line gets you the most in this part of Texas. It's close to four and a half minutes. But I actually, it's about 120 miles in, you know, the width of the path. So about 60 miles from the edge of the center. If you're about a third of the way to the center, so about 20 miles in, you're, 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 you're basically about three and a half minutes, you know, versus four and a half minutes. So obviously the better to get to the center line, but you really don't have to get, you know, if you can find any place within, you know, again, the two thirds, you, you'll be in pretty good shape. It's really when you get to the edge that it really starts to drop off. That's critical for places right on the edge, like San Antonio, which, you know, hopefully people just don't stay there be because they hear it's in the center, it's in totality, half of it's not. Okay, so again, that's that shows you can see all the rest of the ones. So he also has a very nice uh, table of, you know, which you can find online too. Uh, and you can see, you know, even though Mexico, lots of Mexico, like Mazatlan is, is you know, great weather, but it's even about, you know, 20 seconds less or 10 seconds less total totality than in the center line in Texas. Um, you know, so people uh, can people will be able to find all this because we have the references. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This, got, this is all from his source. Okay. All right. So they can look through all that. You know, the interactive solar eclipse <clears throat> Google maps are, are fantastic. I'll just zoom in. What What's really nice about this, and again, you show an example earlier, you know, for planning purposes, you know, clicking on a bit. You get now the key on you know, one thing you want to point out here is not just the times of the partial and total, but you get the altitude and the azimuth of where the sun is going to be. And that, that's kind of critical for lining up, you know, are you going to be able to see it, you know, where you are? And that's uh, it's not so much for this one is such a high altitude anyway, 67, 68 degrees. It shouldn't be a problem wherever you are, but uh, but it's good to know. Okay. Accessibility, you know, again, you know, it's pretty flat where we're going to be. Now, the only issue about border crossing and safety, I just want to point out, just because, you know, Mazatlan is 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 kind of a prime area. 
people, I'm not going to dwell on this, but people can go, you know, try, the State Department has these travel advisories. You know, last fall, they did put that Sinaloa state and level four, which is do not travel because of, you know, crime and kidnapping threats. Uh, earlier, you know, about a month ago, there was another security alert went out where they basically shut down the consulate for services. Just something to be aware of. I mean, if you stay within Mazatlan in the, in the uh, you know, tourist zone and never leave, you, you should be fine. But of course, if there's any clouds there, that means you can't get out of there, so. All right, travel logistics, transportation, lodging. Uh, you know, Greg talked a lot about that. You know, it's it. You know, really, a decision whether to. You know, and then we talked about this at the first meeting too. You know, whether to to drive or to to fly. Uh, it really comes down to how much you're carrying and and how much time you have. And lodging is I'm not going to you know is pretty key too. But as, as Greg mentioned, you know, try to get it and wherever you're going early. Uh, mobility, you know, again, this this had really has to do with, you know, in the days prior to, you know, looking you know, if clouds are going to be a problem or less morning of that, that's going to be really difficult to do. But but, you know, that's really you're only going to be doing a short distance, but picking a place that has mobility in, in 2017. Again, I was in Douglas, as Greg pointed out. It was great highways, you know, to the 25 went all the way left, pretty much paralleling the center line. I could have gone all the way to, to Jackson if needed or to right. I could have gone down to uh, Nebraska. But uh, in 2024, you know, you don't have something paralleling. It's, it's really going to be more kind of northeast, to, you know, going the I mean, you still can get, you know, travel, you know, a little bit further, but it's really uh is because of the good road network, but just something to be considering. Uh, as far as predictions, just really quick, uh, uh, you know, I helped our group in 2017 with, you know, trying to help predict, or is it going to be an issue for, uh, and there were two major resources. One, uh, Michael Zeeler actually had provided a nice, beautiful service, you know, in conjunction with, with some others uh, to, to get some predictions a few days ahead of time. You know, and you can just see that was like a week ahead of time. Here's three, you know, three days, you know, and two days and one day. Uh, and, the, and these he posted and, and we provide. I also went online and I found uh, some predictions myself using the GFS model, you know, global forecast system. Uh, so this, this and, and that's available for different regions. So since I was in Wyoming, you know, this was for the Northwest USA. Uh, this is looking five days ahead at, and again, this is the, all at the time of totality, uh, you know, and then you can see, and what's nice about here, you get low clouds, medium clouds, high clouds and total and, and, and the low and medium, you know, are, are looking pretty good. And then again, 84 hours out, you know, 60 hours, 36 hours, 18 hours. And we were doing pretty confident, you know, you know, Douglas is, is in Southeast Wyoming and, uh, and, and it was clear all throughout. There was some high clouds further east, further west, and actually Casper did experience some high, high, little bit of high clouds. Um, sightseeing opportunities. That's obviously a, a, it's more important for foreign travel, you know, because there's never a guarantee you're you're going to see it. I mean, there's always a chance, you know, from uh, that there could be clouds. So so it's it's that may be an overriding factor too what area you want to go travel for the u.s it's, it's a little bit less you know but you, i just want to make the most of things um site specific considerations uh so i mentioned the sight lines of you so once you've de determined where you're going to go uh what specific you know place uh it's important to again once you know where what direction to look you know check for obstructions or trees or buildings or you may want to look for uh, a, a hill or something to make an interesting, you know, shot too during totality if it's low. But this is going to be such a high eclipse, high altitude, it's, it's probably not going to be an issue. Other ground site considerations uh, are there, you know, if, if you're in a parking lot of some business, there's a good chance the automatic lights will come on when it gets dark, you know, if you can't control it. So that's really a concern. If you're in a park or a school, uh, you can usually work with them and they'll shut off the lights. Or if you're in a field, that's not an issue. Background noise too, you want to kind of, in my opinion, you want to try to avoid too. I mean, this is 
seeing an eclipse is almost like you know really like a spiritual experience and you want to hear traffic in the background but again that's just a consideration and finally you know facilities you know you're going to be in an area for at, for most of a day i mean it's like three hours from the partial phases and then you want to get, you have to get there at least a few hours ahead of time and because of traffic you're not going to leave anytime soon so having access to a restroom or a porta potty you know would be good food and drinks I mean, you can get stuff ahead of time put it in a cooler and then make sure all your batteries are charged um and then of course your personal considerations and what how much cost and time you have and and who you're and who you're going to travel with i mean you know again for this one is because it's in the u.s um it's for me it was an opportunity to, to have more than just you know me and my wife who travel around the world bring other friends and family and and so uh or if a lot of people have friends and family in the eclipse zone in the in, in the uh 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 path of totality I mean that's a consideration too you know even even if the weather may be not perfect it's a chance to actually you know be there with a lot of people and and you never know I mean things have a tendency to, to work out um so so that's really basically what I have all the just flipping through a final couple charts I mean this is just the, the graph of showing the, over the, the 20s and the, up until 1940 what are the opportunities so of course in the US you've got the annular eclipse in in about 10, 10 8 months and then the total eclipse so the annual eclipse I know we're not talking about that there's you know that's a but the, what's cool about that is it crosses in Texas and so you know while while it does go through a lot of cool national parks in the west I'll, you know it's a cool thing to actually see an eclipse in the same spot 6 months apart an annual and total so here's kind of again this is from Michael Zeiler's uh so the 120 mile square area where you've got totality and annularity occurring, you know, same time. And they're both pretty much equivalent times too, but, you know, between four and five minutes uh, at the, at the peak, well, about four, you know, so uh, that's all I have, you know, and this is, uh, you know, looking towards the future, you know, again, you know, 2045, can't wait for that one, you know. Okay. <laughs> any, any questions? <laughs> No, I kind of okay, went thanks. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, I think okay. I think we may invite you back to talk in more detail about some of the some okay. of your experiences. That was that was supposed to be the intent to just get a quick summary this time, and uh, you've got a lot of of stories to tell about the places you've gone. So that may be yeah. of separate interest. But let's let's move on. Let's get to Dan Ward and give him some time. He had some specific um, recommendations about how to observe, and then. Then we'll talk about future meetings and some of the subjects we'll go into for those. So I think I do have Dan's slides. So let me pull those up and see if I can share. Uh, so I'm kind of in the impossible situation first of following two great presentations by Greg and Lloyd, who, who gave us a lot of excellent content. Plus, I also have the impossible task of trying to squeeze 20 pounds of dog food into a two pound bag. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, but I, I think what I would like to do uh, once Alan pulls my deck up is I'd like to just quickly walk through all of the slides with minimal comments on each and then focus on whatever time I have left <laughs> on, on just one of the slides. And then the, the whole deck will be available as, as uh, they, they get posted later for anybody that wants to spend more time on some of the slides. Uh, I don't have the international experience Lloyd has. Uh, I've, I've observed. Uh, I've observed. Uh, two total and uh, one annular. I've had two total trips, international trips. I had to cancel out for various family reasons at the last minute, which was not a, a cheap experience, as, as you can imagine. Uh, and then I've got uh, a dozen or so partial eclipses that I've have uh, I have observed as well. I've only been clouded out on one total eclipse, and that was uh, when I was very young, so I didn't actually have to travel somewhere. Um, I, I will talk a little bit about some of the slides while, while Alan's still pulling them up. The uh, Aruba and uh, the same one, the Caribbean that uh, Lloyd talked about. I, I went to that eclipse with the Boston ATM group. There were 200 people that traveled together for that eclipse. And I was uh, carrying a, a, a four-year-old and a, a seven, almost eight-year-old kid with me at that point in time. 
uh, that was a heck of a lot of fun. And my, my wife still points to that as, as probably the, the great experience. But talking about weather, Aruba was considered to be only a 10% probability of clouds. It was raining an hour and a half before first contact. And some of the people in the group got in a total panic and they decided to drive to the north side of Aruba. Oh. And uh, basically those of us who stayed on the beach had a one, the, the rain stopped, it cleared up and we had a wonderful view of the eclipse. Sure. Uh, whereas those who drove to the north side of the island uh, stayed under the clouds the entire time and missed the whole thing. Uh, some friends uh, had a similar experience at the, the 91 eclipse in Hawaii. Uh, those who stayed in the hotel saw the eclipse. Those who tried to get out from under the clouds uh, missed out. I, I will talk about one thing is uh, going to eclipse with, with young kids or grandkids, uh, you know, from first contact to last contact is typically three hours. Uh, that's a heck of a long time to keep the children entertained. Here we are. So again, I would like to just, Alan, quickly walk through each of these. So uh, if you go ahead and move to the next one. Uh, okay, this is safety reminder. Go ahead. And I left that out there because I thought is you know it's always good to have this warning. But if you go ahead and move on to the next one, uh, this is the one I want to come back to and talk to a little bit about uh, getting yourself uh, psyched for the eclipse once you've figured out where you're going. Go ahead and, and, and move on. Okay. I did want to show this one. Not all solar filters are created equal. So I got, uh, as you can see here, these are five different brands of solar eclipse filters. And they were all shot using a Nikon 300 millimeter uh, lens, telephoto lens. And you can see the difference in color from those five filters. And I will say the Vader is by far the most fine resolution of those five filters. Uh, actually, I would say I was the most dissatisfied with the most more expensive uh, Thousand Oaks glass filter out of this group. Uh, so anyway, I, I wanted to show that. Go ahead to the next one. And this is uh, one of Fred Espinock's things, just showing you know the image scale of what you can expect. And this is uh, the, the the black numbers are 35 millimeter. The blue numbers would be what it would be with a DSLR. Go ahead to the next. Yeah, and those are compared to a true a true frame, right? Yeah, uh, four by yeah, that, that's a true 35 millimeter frame. Yeah, so you don't don't go too long is the ex, is the yeah. uh, conclusion. Uh, and okay, again, skip over on this one. Let's go on to the next okay. one. Um, uh, interesting at, at Aruba, the guy behind me was shooting uh, uh, Kodachrome uh, through a, a 400 millimeter uh, Nikon lens, and I could hear him there in totality just click, 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 click. He forgot to remove his solar filter, he did not get a <laughs> single image of a totality. Uh, so you know. And funny on that one, that particular eclipse, uh, the uh, the Tut Hills were very close to us, and uh, somebody that did a recording of the eclipse thought the Tut Hills sounded like they were doing a, a porno flip or something. Ooh, ah, ooh! I mean, <laughs> it is an incredible experience. And the Tut Hills were in their, you know, probably their seventies at that point in time. Okay, go ahead to the next one. Uh, yeah, this this is actually one of my favorite eclipses until we've gotten into some of the more recent ones, one my favorite uh, film eclipse. Go ahead to the next. That's your picture, Dan? I know, that, that's uh, Luc Viator. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, this is my point. Those are my daughters, and uh, they were bored stiff a good portion of the time. But they actually enjoyed the annular eclipse more because I got them involved and uh, my wife was interviewing them, you know, like they were on a radio program. I was interviewed by a local TV station and they were kind of copying me, but, uh, but I did uh, go ahead to the next one. I had them do projects like the Aruba sign. I had my daughters with, with a, a small nail punching out the letters for Aruba and then using the, uh, the, the Eclipse photo shadows. Now, if you could go back to slide number three. So what I want to talk about here is, is uh, I was living in Connecticut uh, in, in the 90s and I set up, I had a, uh, what I was using in Aruba is I had a 300 millimeter Nikon lens and I piggybacked that on a four inch Mead uh, Matsutov. Uh, and because I was using film and shutters, I practiced for the totality to go back and forth between the shutters. So the shutter vibration from one 
would not interfere with the, the shutter of the, the exposure of the others. So going back and forth, I got out like every Saturday and spent a, an hour or two when the sun was roughly at the same height. And I practiced my timing on that. I had had so many friends that talked about getting eclipse fever and forgetting to do what they wanted to do, just standing there and not. Uh, it, now I was standing in the snow in February in Connecticut practicing all this. On Aruba, we were on the beach for about five hours altogether. Uh, I had built a bracket to hold the 300 millimeter on top of the, the, the four inch mead. And I built it partially out of foam. It melted in the sun. I did not know it had melted in the sun. And when I took my eclipse filters off, the 300 millimeter lens suddenly was pointing at the beach instead of the sky. And uh, okay, we're at we're diamond ring. I pull off the filters. I see my 300 millimeters taking a dive to the beach. And, and for about 15 seconds, I'm sit, standing there saying WTF, WTF, WTF. And then I realized I'm missing the eclipse. So then I, I just basically shot with the, uh, the four inch mead and forgot about the 300. Uh, I had practiced, but I had not practiced in the conditions that the eclipse was going to be. You know, there's a big difference between standing in snow in Connecticut and standing on a hot beach. Uh, I, so trying to have a duplicate for that, I do recommend, I knew a lot, I saw a lot of people struggling trying to remove a screw-on filter during totality. Uh, even if you have a screw-on filter, figure out a way to, to slide it on and off, you know, use uh, cardboard paper or something like that, because you don't, you don't want to have to struggle with anything during totality. It's too spectacular of a time. Uh, I do, do recommend people getting your filters well in advance. Now wouldn't be a bad time to do it. The, uh, the annular eclipse that I did, I, I shot, a, I used a C8 for that and I used a Thousand Oaks filter. Something that happened on annular that I haven't seen with total eclipse is uh, with a ring of fire, you have a bright image, but it's a lot less than you have normally with the full sun. I got, it was like the barbershop mirrors back and forth. Uh, especially with the Thousand Oaks fil filter, which is highly uh, shiny on the backside. So uh, that really messed up some of my images of the annular eclipse. So uh, you can tilt the mirror, tilt the filter and not have as much of that issue, but you, you don't want a zoom lens because you have multiple elements for internal reflections and such. Uh, I use Eclipse Orchestrator uh, for uh, uh, the Nashville eclipse. So the intervalometer I had set up all the time using, so I didn't have to think about it. You know, I started the button and I had all of my exposures and a whole series of, of, of exposures to get variations so I could get the Corona x uh, I did, I, I went with the battery power setup. The hotel actually ran power out to the field. I thought, well, this is cool. I, I don't have to depend on the battery. So I went ahead and plugged in the power. Uh, then they, uh, somebody requested the hotel shut off the power because they had outside lights that they didn't want those during totality. Uh, that caused a little bit of a surge in my laptop and I had to reboot my Eclipse orchestrator with two minutes before totality, which was a stress. I got it. I did it. I, it was stress I didn't need. You know, if, you know, if I'd stayed with battery power the entire time, it wouldn't happen. And a uh, point that I think Lloyd made, it'd be existential. You know, uh, I went to Nashville because uh, we we did family stuff. We had a family get together. We went to Grand Ole Opry. We went to Johnny Cash Museum. We, we saw all kinds of local sites. And even if we had been totally clouded out, uh, we had a great vacation. My wife had a cousin who was 30 miles from us. We were in Hendersonville, uh, Tennessee, just, just outside of Nashville. Her cousin was 30 miles away. He was completely soft in the clouds the entire time. 30 miles away. So, you know, you don't know. Uh, we roll the dice, we take their shot. Okay, so that's uh, with the amount of time, you know, we're already over here. Uh, I'll stop at this point. The slides are, Alan, I, I guess they're going to be available somewhere where they can be downloaded. If uh, anybody has any questions, don't hesitate. To yes, we'll have, we'll have the slides and the video together in a, in a folder for people to get or in, indications of where they are. Okay, I, I appreciate it, Dan, uh, a very good summary. And, uh, and we can go over some of this, especially your recommendations. You have, you have recommendations both on visual and recommendations on photography. And I think we're gonna go over that separately. Um, let me try to go back to my slides to conclude. So um, 
Uh, we talked last time about Eclipse Glasses. Uh, Woody Davis is, uh, is doing some things looking for sponsorship and uh, the Novak board uh, is supportive of, uh, of, of Novak getting, uh, getting some slides. We're gonna be looking for possibly sponsorships or sharing arrangements uh, to have something that we can distribute uh, of course, in this area, both eclipses will be partial, so it's important that as we do outreach, we'll try to uh, get eclipse glasses to people. Uh, we would be looking for somebody to come up with a Novak design. If any of you are creative, please let me know. And uh, um, Chris Kagey and Dan Ward have um, shared some um, information sheets that Novak will be able to distribute. Hopefully, that will be with glasses, but as we do outreach uh, again before the, uh, even before the October eclipse this year, we'll have something to give. Um, there'll probably be another version of that that has information resources for amateurs, for members of the club. We'll be looking at um, places to get information about uh, how to observe, how to plan to observe. A lot of the things that Lloyd showed about weather and locations and uh, Javert's uh, interactive map, for example, will be on there. Um, so we'll have that sheet too. Uh, Ralph Marple said he was gonna to try to collect um, information about destinations specific. Uh, I don't know if he's on tonight. Um, I haven't had a chance to follow up with him to see what he's gonna do with that. And um, Paul Severance said he would like to tie in with the 3D printing SIG. Uh, there are several people who have 3D printing machines in the club and um, maybe make up specialized filter holders uh, that, that meet the recommendations that, that people like Dan mentioned about, uh, even if you have a telephoto lens, get something that's easy to remove and uh, easy to put back on and doesn't have light leakage around the ed edge for ghosting, which is another thing that can come in and get in your way. Uh, my observation is the most important thing is to be able to take it off during totality. It's less important to be able to put it on afterward because if you miss the partial phases afterwards, you'll be happy with yourself. But if you miss totality, you won't be happy with yourself. So take it off and leave it off if necessary. Next meeting. Um, would be in about a month. Uh, we talked about alternating Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's probably fair to, to even out who can attend. Um, I did want to ask, should these meetings be monthly or every other month? Do people have a strong feeling? Uh, we do have a couple of topics queued up. So maybe monthly so we can get information out to people early on. Alan, Alan, this is Greg. My vote would be for monthly. I know that there's a lot of detail and angst that I had leading up to the 2017 about specific procedures for photography and that sort of thing. And uh, the earlier people understand those and can adjust and maybe buy what they need before they're all out of stock. I think that right. would be helpful. Right. I think, I think that's the intent to, uh, to not wait until just a few months before the eclipse to be through with things. And uh, maybe the next sessions won't be quite as intense. I will try to jam as much stuff in as did tonight, because obviously people had more to present than, uh, than we planned for. And uh, certainly we'll be able to have the same speakers come back and talk in more, uh, in more, with more time, with more meetings. Um, so that next gets to the, um, the topics, I think there probably is opportunity for more member experiences to be related either in more detail or uh, get additional people to speak who are willing to. Um, uh, two specific things we know, I know from the survey and from what people have said, I'd like to have it one session that goes through exactly what the phases are, what you would see in the various phases primarily visually uh, to give, especially first timers, uh, an idea in a narrative sense, hearing from members what they saw at an eclipse and what uh, they recommend people prepare to look at. 
uh, both during partial phases, during uh, diamond ring, the appearance, uh, maybe even the flash spectrum, shadow bands, what you see in the corona, and uh, what the best optics are for visually looking at the eclipse. And then separately, uh, it'll probably be several sessions on what people did for photography that worked well, uh, both as far as portability, equipment setups that they can take, and, um, and photographically what worked, what, what camera setups, what to expect to do, where to get references on how to do exposures. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, Orchestrator, which seems to be the go-to piece of software. Maybe there's something else that's come about that people can describe as a way to, uh, to plan your observations, plan your photography, so you're not fussing with F ratios and exposure times during totality. Uh, and separately, we've, uh, we've made contact with uh, someone who's organizing uh, Daniel can remind me of the, of the gentleman's name. Matt Penn. Oh, Matt. Um, yes, Matt Penn, who um, is organizing a program where people will observe the eclipse from uh, from coast to coast, from Mexico to the Maritimes, if if it's clear, to get hours of viewing of the corona and seeing dynamics in the corona and the chromosphere uh, through the uh, through the day during the total eclipse. So that's sort of the schedule for the next, uh, next few sessions. Anybody else have any comments, questions, suggestions? Things Alan, this is Greg. Thanks again yep. for organizing this. I appreciate your comments and getting me down from my, my 40 page uh, tome down to something a little more digestible. That was uh, good advice. Uh, but I wanted to mention that I was surprised that we had such similar comments about a couple things among the uh, presenters. And one of them was to make sure that you don't, you know, uh, put all your eggs in one basket. And if you're going to have to travel to go somewhere uh, to see the eclipse, make sure that you have a full spectrum visit planned so that if you're eclipse falls through for whatever reason, you know, some big weather event that you weren't planning on, you still have uh, an experience uh, uh, to enjoy and, and to share with, with other people. I, I, think, I think that's uh, a, a real important thing. And I was surprised that everyone mentioned that. I thought that was just something that I did because I was a photographer and I didn't want to go out there while my wife was taking care of a sick pet and then end up missing the eclipse and then coming back with my tail between my legs and nothing to show for it while she was taking care of a sick pet. So anyway, and in that regard, of course, when I went and went from Riverton up to Jackson, that meant I had a second place that I had to take care of lodging. And I briefly mentioned that but that was a little bit of a struggle and requires some effort as well. So it's the total package that you have to take care of. Once that's out of the way, then you can start uh, working on your photography technique and all that other stuff. And you'll be much more comfortable in having that all laid out. Yeah, I think um, the, the trade-off between flying and having local transportation versus driving your own car the whole way is one that um, I don't have a good solution for, but that, that gets in there with how flexible you can be, um, how much of a vehicle you have and how much you stuff take, how much stuff to take with you um, and whether your stuff is portable. And, and certainly everybody emphasizes practice, practice, practice beforehand. So you're not figuring out your equipment um, in the field. That's just never a good idea. I will add one thing on I because we were doing a family get together in Nashville. I had multiple hotel rooms in one hotel, and then I had one room in another hotel because we couldn't get them all in one. The, no problem on the rooms I had booked a year in advance in the the three rooms, but the other hotel they canceled the room reservation two weeks before the eclipse because they had an opportunity to make a lot of bucks, 
And uh, so we ended up with uh, some people sleeping on the floor in the other hotel because uh, some greed got in the way. So, you know, you want to confirm, make your reservations early and confirm them multiple times. Yeah. Yeah, no control over that. And, um, yeah, some of these hotels may not quite realize what's coming up yet. Uh, although there are various outreach projects to make sure that communities know as a commercial venture what's coming. Um, yeah, in, two, in 2017, I didn't stay in the zone of totality. I stayed outside of it with the plan to drive into it. I ended up car camping where I was going to observe because it was such a nice place the day before. I didn't go back to the hotel. I just stayed in the car that night. Um, and I'd, I'd rather be um, not stuck on the road and not quite as rested, but know exactly where I was going to be and have left my equipment set up right next to the car. So um, I didn't plan to camp, but I was with a nice group of people who were supportive and just laid back in the car. And by the way, it was very cold, but I survived. Okay, so we'll have more suggestions like that at future meetings. Any other uh, final comments from people before we wrap this up? Okay, well, it looks like we had uh, about 20 people, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, 20 people, maybe a few more online, which is pretty good. Um, we'll go back to Thursday uh, in about four or five weeks. Uh, I'll send out the notice. And um, I think we'll plan on, on doing, um, get some people to talk about what to expect for visual observing during the eclipse and uh, get that as a lead in to photography the final, the, the next time afterwards. So thank, thanks everybody. I'll let everybody know where this is gonna be posted. Uh, Pamela and Chris Kage have been very helpful in getting it edited and posted onto YouTube. So it'll be generally available to the people who dialed in and uh, even to the people who missed it. So thanks again and uh, see you in a month. Uh, just put in a reminder, February 25th, we're gonna be at uh, Blue Ridge Center um, for a visit there and let people in the club become familiar with observing at that location. Uh, Blue Ridge Center for Environmental Stewardship up near uh, um, Harpers Ferry a new observing site for the club. Okay, so see everybody later. Good night.